My name is James Graves, and welcome to another edition of Night Journey Rewind, the podcast. I got another exciting interview for you. Well, I don't like to call them interviews. I know another great conversation for you. This Francisco Nato started playing electric and upright bass, and uh, he got a BA to jazz performance from California Jazz Conservatory. He was introduced to music by his pops. His mm -hmm, pops was right. a jazz bassist in the San Francisco scene. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you, bassist Ali Duak. Yeah, yeah. How you doing, man? Welcome to the good. show. Oh, good. Great to be here. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, I kind of gave an introduction on uh, who you are and how you got started. But was there something key to the music bebop, jazz, and when you went over to Cuba to really get into the Afro roots of the music? What was that key? thing or that key note or that key music that key song that said oh yeah this is what i want to do uh i think i, I think i just uh, actually well to be honest uh just down the block at cafe international that's where that's kind of where it all started oh really I mean, right down yeah. the street from us right down down there yeah um so i when i was 17 years old i just i was taking the bus by there and i heard on a sunday night i heard some some music coming from there and uh, they had people playing, uh, you know, all, all, all levels, you know, different, different levels. And so I, at that time, I was just a beginner and um, they were very supportive of me um, playing like just and, and they invited me to play with them on Sundays. And and from then on, it just that's how that's how it kind of started, because uh, I would play there every Sunday and um, I would I would learn. I was learning. I was like a sponge, just constantly <laughs> learning. Mm -hmm. And so I think, and I think the best way to get into something is to, to just to do it a lot, right? Like put in, like Malcolm Gladwell wrote in that book, 10,000 hours, you know? So just putting time in and um, yeah, and, and you learn as you go and you, and sometimes you learn how to do things better or, re, or redo things. Um, yeah, so you kind of fine tune as you go, but that, that really helped me just put my foot in the door. Uh, and learn and learn about jazz and get into jazz in the film one. Now, in the beginning, as you said, you were taking notes, you were like a sponge and you're getting, so I'm quite sure indirectly or maybe even directly, you were emulating other bass players. When did you finally say, okay, with all these cats that I've emulated, I took this, that, that, this, and so on, that I was able to develop my sound. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's it's 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 always a work in progress, right? It's it's, it's still it's still going today. So yeah, I mean, uh, I think um, yeah, I, you you kind of just take a little bit, you borrow. You, I like the word borrow, borrow a little bit from from different sounds you like, and then and then uh, create your own, create what you you know what you hear in your own head. Uh, so yeah, like uh, I think I definitely am heavily influenced by uh, Paul Chambers. Um, uh, a little bit of Wilbur Ware, um, Mingus, of course, um, Jimmy Blanton, um, uh, yeah, Charlie Hayden, of course, and mm. uh, so, yeah, a little bit of Scott LaFaro, uh, Ray Brown, another great so, basis. Because all of us have such different sounds. Yeah. Do you ever get confused uh, when you when you're playing or really trying to get things going and you're trying to take this ray brown take something from mingus take something from charlie hayden and the list goes on paul chambers does it get confusing do you get confused in your head trying to get your own sound but taking some of these other cats great legend sounds well i i think there there's certain aspects about each different players that i like like i like maybe i like the tone of sam jones so I'll, I'll try to like see if I can get a, t a, t a tone comparable to that or similar to that. And then maybe I'll like, um, I'll, I really like the groove of Ray Brown or something. So I'll try to, I'll try to see if I can, uh, you know, I really admire Ray Brown's time, timekeeping. So I'll, so I'll say, how, you know, how can I improve my time to play more like, more in that, that spirit? So I, I take things, like I, I look at little aspects of, of the players I admire, and I, I try to build on that, and then um, I, I and then I create my own my own thing, um, of course. Um, so yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You can the, no one can play you like you, right? So, right. Yeah. Right. So so that's the goal is 
is always to put that in, into creating your own sound. And yeah, and yeah, hopefully I'm doing that. <laughs> when do you, or maybe you're already starting to feel, do you feel like you're developing and getting your own sound now? I see, I was yeah. looking at, I was looking at your booking dates and you got a lot of booking dates this year. Yeah. And uh, so what was it, or I, I, I'm just always curious to know, what was it or what sound or what song kind of said, okay, okay, I'm developing my own sound now? Um, let's see. Uh, I think after hearing, well, after hearing Paul Chambers, um, he's on so many recordings, so many, so that's like an iconic jazz sound. Right. So then, so I, so, you know, I was, I was, you know, playing along recordings and listening to recordings and, and so, so he had that sound, but I, but I was thinking I, I listened to Wilbur Ware and I was like, okay, I like what he's doing too. And Ray Brown. And, uh, I think, um, and Sam, and, and someone, and someone said that they, they, they thought I sounded a little like Sam Jones one time. I don't know, mm -hmm. or similar to that vibe, but, um, but, uh, yeah, I could, I don't know. I, I just, I try to have my own thing, but, um, but yeah, I just I love I love listening to great great basses, and um, I think uh, it took it did it takes a while it takes a while to develop your own sound you know right right and it took me a long it took me a long a long time too like it you know you have to put in um, you know you have to assimilate the sounds you hear and then and then create and, and then so yeah so it's a process definitely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I mean, it's it's you just put it in the it it goes through the woodshed, you put the time <laughs> in the woodshed, and then that's 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 what comes out, I guess. Yeah. Well, that's a good that's a good yeah. analogy. I like that yeah. the woodshed. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, just on the side note, I really feel that Wilbur Ware was a silent assassin. He didn't get a lot of pub like Ron Carter, Mingus, uh, Paul Chambers, and and you know, and the list goes on. Cause there's a lot of bad Larry Gales. I mean, this cat was bad with the audience, yeah. you know. Oh, Larry, I love Larry. Yeah, you mentioned mm -hmm. Larry Gales. So he's one yeah. of my favorite. And uh, I had the opportunity to interview him, and oh my God, that was an interesting. I mean, this was during the time that I was still trying to learn this music, so I was really blessed living in Los Angeles to talk to people like Larry Gales, Billy Higgins, Cedar Walton, and cats like that. So that's really where I got my rude awakening of really what this music is about. But back to Wilbur Ware, it just seems like this cat was bad, but he was, to me, he was just a silent assassin. What is your feelings on that? Well, you know, I was, uh, I was working in the, in the Bayview, uh, near, like Bayview Hunters Point area. What I used to work like, uh, passing out flyers for uh, the Bayview Opera House. And I actually met, uh, Wilbur Ware's relative, uh, Eric, I think his name is Eric. He's a poet. And he was just, he was just barbecuing. He was just barbecuing in front of his house, you know? And, uh, and then I started, started to, we had a conversation and then, and then, uh, he, he heard that I was listening to music. And I think I was listening to Wilbur. <laughs> and, okay. uh, so what are the odds of that, you know? And then he's like, oh, what kind of, is it, are you listening, you like jazz? And then he, so my, and then he told me his name. And then I was like, he's like, you're not related to Wilbur, where are you? And then he, and then he said he was, <laughs> and then. So that was a shock to me, you know. So like things like that are kind of inspiring when, when you just kind of randomly come upon that, you know. But um, but uh, yeah, I know, and I heard the also listened to a little bit of the. There's actually a seven hour interview on, on YouTube. Uh, I think uh, I'm not sure who does the interview, but uh, but yeah, there's a lot of interesting knowledge. I I kind of skimmed through. I didn't have seven hours to listen to the whole thing. Right, right, right. <laughs> but right. I kind of I skimmed through. And I know I heard that he mentioned that he really he was really influenced by the song called Mingus Fingers, which Charles Charles Mingus uh, wrote when he was playing in a big band. Um, and uh, so I checked that out, and I could see that. And I know Mingus was influenced by um, Jimmy Blanton as well. Mm -hmm. So um, so yeah, I also studied I studied Mingus and did several uh, research reports on Charles Mingus at, at my time at the CJC um, under uh, Dr. Anthony Brown, who's uh, a great teacher. Um, and so, yeah, so I know I, I think so. So I added that to, to the tunes that, that I play on gigs, uh, Mingus Fingers. 
So mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great one to check out too. All yeah. right. Yeah. My name is James Graves. This is Night Journey Rewind, and we're visiting with bassist Ale Duzik. You know, you've been playing for a while now. What inspires you as far as in writing music, your compositions of how you get, you know, how do you come up with the creative <laughs> ideas as far yeah. as in putting music yeah. together? Yeah, that's a, I'm glad you asked that, actually. Um, so uh, the last album I, I, uh, I created, uh, I had a little bit of a deadline because um, my wife was uh, pregnant with our mm. son. So I wanted to make sure we, we, we had the recording out before before that, because then I knew I was gonna, I wasn't going to have a little bit of time for, exactly. for a little bit. So so there was a little bit of a push, but I, I knew I had a lot of material already. So I just had to write like a, a few more tunes and I could have a, a full album. So I did. I, I, I did that. I did, did exactly that. And, uh, and it was inspiring because uh, also the time in um, when we were at home during the lockdown, that, that offered more time for composing and and uh, so that was great too, but also more inspiring because more time to think about life and things. And uh, so I thought it was actually good timing <laughs> for that. Um, yeah, it gave me the opportunity to, you know, to work on that really. Um, so yeah, the album was with uh, Javier Santiago on, on piano and Genius Wesley on drums. And um, yeah, that was a great experience to record. It was all my original compositions on that one. So you gotta send yeah. me a copy of, you gotta give yeah, me a copy. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I have a show that I record on Sunday mornings and uh, it's on this internet station. So I do two hours of jazz and I would definitely like to add that to my collection to play on Sunday mornings. So I'm excited. You're coming to the Peacock Lounge May 31st for two shows, eight and, you know, around 915. Tell us what can we expect from the young bassist? Oh yeah, okay. Well, we're gonna have uh, Mike Almost on the trumpet, and uh, yeah, great Mike Almost. Uh, yeah, first call trumpet player in the Bay Area, uh, so that's gonna be exciting. And then we have uh, Spencer Allen on the keys, who uh, I played with, um, uh, who I first met through Azure McCall, um, a great vocalist that lives in the Bay Area. Um, so yeah, we're gonna have uh, Spencer on, on keys, and then John Arkin on drums. Uh, and you know, great drummer. Um, it's been around the bay for a while now, so yeah, I think it's gonna be. Uh, I think it's gonna be a great, great night of music. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I we were talking earlier, off mic, but it, you know, we were. I was comparing both of us. Just well, really, I guess I was comparing more to Southern California to Northern California in the music in the music scene, specifically dealing with jazz. And to me, it just seems to be a more richness to the music, dedication to the music. And I'm not taking anything away from Southern California, but it just seems to be a whole different level in Northern California. What is your feelings on that? Well, it's definitely different. I think uh, uh, LA is more spread out. Uh, if you're talking about LA. But I know San Diego has a little bit of a scene too. But um, yeah, L LA, is, you just need to have a car and. <laughs> and it's every it's here is more you can take public transit to get places and bar we have bar you know and and um i mean nothing go, nothing stays late like new york you know so that's nothing, true no, nothing will be new york but um but yeah i think i think there's a, a cultural richness to the bay area we have like a lot a lot of latin music and uh, a lot of um like world music too from like mm -hmm. you know music from all over the world so so I think it's great, you know, and um, and yeah, there's some there's people who teach at some of these institutions out here that are also playing music on the scene, and uh, it's just it's just rich with a, a lot of variety and uh, high level musicians in the Bay Area. Yeah. That is so true. That is so true. Like I said earlier, going up to the Bay Area now, doing the show at the Peacock Lounge, I just really my mind is just kind of blown of so many great musicians in the Bay Area that are just like, oh, wow, okay, you know. Um, being born in the Bay Area, living in the Bay Area, but you've had a chance to travel around. Let's talk briefly about your travels in Cuba and Brazil. Uh, yeah, well, my wife is from Brazil, so uh, we went there. 
half ago, I think. Yeah. And uh, no, it was great. It was great to go there and see um, Bahia and also Rio de Janeiro and um, just, just uh, hear the music and um, my wife's hometown of uh, Coenchina. And um, yeah, we just we went all over. You know, it was just. It was good to see the country, and uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of soy. They grow a lot of soy out there, mm-hmm. and a lot of beef, a lot of beef, a lot of cows. Um, but uh, yeah, the richness in the music it was just just great to hear so much uh, high level music, and um, it's just yeah, beautiful country, and the people were, were were really nice to me and um, had a great time in Cuba. It was it was. Um, yeah, it was. It was. I was kind of out of my comfort zone because I'd never been in a, a country like that. I guess where you know they don't have credit cards or right. Uh, Everything so, is cash. Yeah. So so I wasn't used to that. Um, some of the infrastructure was kind of like falling apart and stuff. I wasn't used to seeing that, you know. But but they had um, they had a wealth, an intangible wealth that. Uh, there was no homeless people there. Like everyone knows how to read. Uh, they have good health care. So I see the benefits of it. Um, I know not all the people are happy. I talked to some of the people there. Like, you know, they feel kind of some. Some people feel a little stuck there. But, but, uh, but I think there there are some like huge benefits of a society like that, where you can just walk around and feel safe at night. And like, mm-hmm. you know, a- a- everyone's basic needs are kind of taken care of. Um, uh, but. But at the same time, yeah, and they have, uh, they treated their musicians really well, like, um, they're, you know, better than here, I thought, <laughs> you know, so, um, so that was interesting to see, see that too, uh, just a, just a different society, how it interacts with the people. Yeah. The richness in the music of Brazil and Cuba, Yeah. can you, can you even describe it compared to, I mean, from what you've been listening to, I'm not taking anything away from the music, but it's just, I just said, the reason why I asked that, I had a friend that just came back from Cuba and he just told me, oh my God, the music scene is just unbelievable. Yeah, no, it's great. So, so, so what I, what I kind of thought, I thought about this a lot actually. And, and so, so in, in the U.S., the hand drum tradition was kind of taken away during, um, because, uh, there was, they, uh, the, the colonizers on the, the, the West Coast, they, they kind of equated it with um, slave revolts or they didn't want, um, during slavery, they didn't want um, people revolting. So they were afraid that that would cause that. So they uh, they banned hand drums. So, so that, but in, but in Brazil and in, in Cuba, there is more of a hand drum, hand drum tradition. So, um, so you see that uh, there, but, but even without the hand drum, you can see how the, those rhythms from, you know, native from africa still come through right. into jazz and then also Af- you know afro-cuban um afro-brazilian music you know so so you see how those intersect and mm-hmm. and they they go together like you can have brazilian jazz you can have cuban jazz you know like they they work they complement each other so so it's interesting to see like things how things fit like a puzzle and uh, <laughs> how they're all connected so um, so that, so that was, that's, that's interesting to me to think about that stuff. Well, I, I hear you. I hear you. I got to get out there. That's all I can say. I got to get out there. Um, you know, this music at times is still not getting the recognition that it should be getting. And to me and a lot of people, probably you to say, feel the same. This is the American classical art form that's being that's being treated second rate. What is your feelings on that? Well, um, I think Herbie, Herbie Hancock had a good quote about this. He said that, um, or he said something like, um, people are in, in more into the culture of now or celebrity. It's, he said, I think he said something like, it's become less about the music and more about the celebrity or who is making the music. So I think we have this um, infatuation with celebrities and worshiping celebrities but um i you know i think yeah i think that's the wrong wrong way to do it i think we, we, yeah we gotta we should focus on the music focus on what that's about art and culture and music and 
yeah and, and you know celebrities are just people you know like they have like let them be let them have their own life <laughs> right well well i agree with you and it, once again i'm not taking anything away from southern california because oh there's a heck of some musicians and there's a culture that is uh um that's really you know taking a toll that's always been happening there but since going to san francisco there every month and plus now really talking and meeting these musicians and hearing them play i don't know it just seems to be a little difference in my eyes but hey we'll leave that alone <laughs> look ollie we're looking forward to you coming to the peacock lounge once again who are the musicians going to be with you that night oh yeah we have mike almost on trumpet john arkin on on drums and spencer allen on piano myself ollie dudek on bass it's going to be a great night hope you can make it out it's uh it sets at 8 p.m and 9 15. it's gonna right. be really fun hope you can make it yeah at the peacock lounge which is 552 hate street in san francisco california it's in the lower haze thank you so much for your time oh thank you thanks for having me <laughs>